For many, the Roswell UFO crash is simply a story. For others, it's a belief in something larger than ourselves. However, for one family, it is a fact. A legacy handed down through three generations, told with verity and certitude. The story of Jesse Marcel Sr. Philip Coppins, historian and author of The Ancient Alien Question, set out on a quest to discover the reality behind Roswell by visiting the one true source, the family of Jesse Marcel. The UFO phenomenon began on June 24, 1947, when Kenneth Arnold saw nine flying objects over Mount Rainier in Washington State. Ever since, we have known the term UFOs, unidentified flying objects. But what if a few days later in early July of 1947, an object crashed in Roswell, New Mexico, and the answer as to what the unidentified stood for became a reality? What if in Roswell in 1947, extraterrestrial beings crash landed on planet Earth, and the government has known about it ever since? The story of Roswell only began to get international recognition from the 1980s onwards. What had happened was that in the late 1970s, a few UFO researchers, specifically Stanton Friedman and Bill Moore, also known as William Moore, began to look into this story. William Moore, and together with Charles Berlitz, had just done a fantastic international best-selling book called The Bermuda Triangle. And writing on that success, they were looking for a follow-up. That follow-up became known as the Roswell Incident. It's a book about the possibility whether or not the story of Roswell happened. The story hinges on the testimony of one single person, Jesse Marcel. What had happened was that in their travels as UFO researchers, they had heard this rumor about this one guy who allegedly had handheld some of the material which had happened at a crash site of an extraterrestrial disc near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. And both Stanton Friedman and Bill Moore went out in search of this man, who at that moment in time was still alive. His name is Jesse Marcel. The story of Jesse Marcel is the core of this documentary. It's the story of three generations of the Marcel family, and three Jesse Marcels as well at that, who all have been intrigued with whether or not the truth of Roswell should become known. And it's an interesting story, because here we have two generations who have handled this material with their own hands. The first person is Major Jesse Marcel. He went to the crash site and brought some of the material back home before he had to take it into the army base. He showed it to his wife, he showed it to his 11-year-old son. Now we have a third generation, Jesse Marcel III, the grandson of Major Jesse Marcel. And he is talking about a lifelong quest to find out what Roswell really is. It, it beckons the, the idea or the thought that, you know, was there actually more to this first sight than has been told? Uh, my grandfather always and once the wink in his eye was always said there's so much more to the story than I can tell you. So much more than the media or he's told of the newspapers at the time and that kind of thing of the shows he's done. But uh, I really believe there was a lot more to that first crack site than we know about. Past the items, past the metal, past the, those materials. And this is the, 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 the date we've narrowed us down to is somewhere around July 2nd, late the evening of July 2nd. It, within a, a few days before that, there was, people were seeing these things everywhere, describing them, blue lights, 
describing them as saucers, looking saucer like saucer plates, put together, flying across the sky. Um, everything from priests to politicians to the to police, they, everybody was seeing these things flying through the valley. And it was backed up. Um, radar was, was finding these targets that would come in and, in and out of range. Uh, and it, it was it, like it, it was. It must have been a very fascinating time to be in the desert to think that all this is going on around you. And uh, again, thinking about this time, UFOs weren't talked about at all. It wasn't. It was, it was nothing. I mean, it, it was I think a, a fascinating oddity, maybe, but it was nothing. No, no reality to it. And here was a whole town of people, literally seeing these things and thinking there is something strange going on now. The legacy of Roswell has been handed down through three generations, not as an event that may have happened, but as a truth that cannot be denied. And therefore the evidence of Roswell is contained in the experiences of those who were actually there. For the Marcel family, Roswell is not a question mark. It is not a controversy. There are no unknowns as to whether or not something happened. The question is just a matter of details as to where they came from, what has happened to the material, whether we have somehow benefited as a species from the material which the government secreted from 1947 onwards. But everything else, the truth that something landed in Roswell, is a family legacy which the Marcells have cherished for several decades and continue to do so. They have spoken out before, but now Jesse Marcel is ready to tell all. He knew what it was. He knew how big it was. And he knew that, that this kind of story, this kind of information could cause, uh, this kind of information could cost you your life. Um, this technology was very important to our government. It was very, very important that the government kept that information tight to their vest. They did not want it getting out. It was, it was their property, no one else's. So what happened? For families like the Marcells, the Blanchards, there was never any doubt. This was true. This has happened. And of course, there was the evidence in the I-beam in the kitchen a few years or a few months afterwards when they were holding it and looking at it and seeing this is evidence of what happened. So what for the rest of the world has been speculation and for very large sections of the world population today continues to be a question mark. For them, it is an absolute truth. They know and the Marcel family are so adamant in getting this out because for them it is a truth which needs to come out into the open. Uh, I have always, you know, as a lot of people have thought about Ralph, well, why didn't they tell people about this? They, you know, they, they felt we couldn't handle it, the people couldn't handle it. I've always thought that doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think people would have loved to have been able to been part of that first, that, that UFO, that life does exist out there the wonderment, the fantastic idea that we're not alone. I think it was more of our government knowing that they had a piece of technology that no one else had. And for us to stay on top, and just like any other top secret program, it was going to be kept, and kept very tight. Uh, like when you think about the, 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 the Mogul Balloon, another top secret program, when in history have you ever seen where they release a top secret program to all the newspapers in color. Well, it's black and white. They bring it out. It's in every newspaper. It's on every radio, disclosing all these details about a top secret program. They decided that well, obviously this Mogul Broom program, although important, it had nothing in comparison to what they had found in the desert that day. So it was easy for them to give up a little bit to, to hold the prize. In 1947, if the government told you to keep a secret, it was considered your patriotic duty to hold that information. Jesse Marcel Sr. was loyal to his country, and above all else, he was a patriot. 
During the press conference, Marcel was told to pose with materials from a mogul balloon. Though he knew it was not the materials he had brought back from Corona, he complied with his orders. You know, that says a couple things about him. One, he could be trusted with information that was obviously very valuable to the war, that they didn't trust, you know, the 99.9% .9 of the people with. Uh, and he, he, was, he was one of those people, they, they, it tells a little bit about himself and his ability to, you know, you can imagine, I'm about to work with a team, I'm going to tell them where to drop a bomb, it's going to kill thousands and thousands of people. To take that responsibility and to be able to put yourself aside and follow your orders. And, and, that, and that's exactly what he did. Um, he really paid for that later in life. At the end of the 1980s, it was clear that the government had to do something. There was massive interest and people were beginning to ask questions. Even people close to American presidents were intrigued to find out what Roswell was really all about. And so in 1994, the American government said that something had indeed happened in Roswell which they couldn't speak about. That it was a secret project called Project Mogul, which involved special air balloons which were somehow floated into the top parts of the sky to find out whether or not atomic explosions had occurred somewhere. And so they couldn't explain this in 1947, which is why there was a cover-up. Now, it didn't answer really why there were bodies. And so a few years later, in 1997, the government came back and said, oh yes, we forgot about that, and the bodies you saw were not human bodies at all. They are test dummies, which we somehow put up in the sky and then dropped to the ground, and this is what people saw. The problem is that those test dummies didn't exist in 1947, and the government was saying that this somehow happened somewhere in the 1950s. And so what the American government is trying to tell you is this, that you have to believe them that somehow in 1947 they lied and that it was a special air balloon which they couldn't talk about and then that somehow later on near Roswell crash dummies landed on ground and that somehow the likes of Marcel Blanchard and everybody else involved with the Roswell story is mistaken that somehow they have put together two stories which happened several years ago several years apart and that they can't tell what really happened at Roswell but that the American government knows perfectly well, and you just have to trust them, that they know perfectly well. Not only had he, had he performed this, this service for our military and done it perfectly, but then he was rejected and basically scapegoated, put in the center of, uh, of a controversy which he would have loved to have talked to people about, something that he believed in, I mean, he believed on his soul, that this was, something from another place. It, it, was, it was the wonderment, the, 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 how he could add to the value of our own human existence to realize there's something else out there that actually came to visit us. Very specifically, so this technology did not exist. That what I found out there was not of this earth or by, built by human hands. Uh, he was very specific. He, he, he left no room to conclude that it was anything but I, he, he wasn't one to say the government covered this up and it wasn't a weather balloon, but he kept to the high road and just said what I saw wasn't from here. And so what we have here is once again what for some people might be a detail but which for those who know and those who like to find out makes a very different story. Roswell is one of those things whereby really there is a question of belief. On the one hand you have a family, the Marcel family, the Blanchards who've never spoken out. All of these families know and they know details about this story 
which is where the beauty of the story lies. You have to believe that they remember what happened. And what they know is very simple, it is very basic. It is a story about a dad and a husband who one evening comes home and says to his family, this is something you have to see because from tomorrow onwards I have no idea what's going to happen. The American government might order a cover-up or we might have an announcement to the world that something truly extraordinary has happened. But either way, I want you, my wife and my son, to be the first to know. Every historical event can be traced back to a pivotal moment. A moment in time when everything changed. For the Marcel family, that moment was the evening when Jesse Marcel Sr. brought home a box of debris from the crash site. It is this moment when the event became real for them and would be handed down through each generation. My father looked on one of the beams, they're like little eye beams, anywhere from four inches, uh, 12 inches, 18 inches, and there was a box that might have had several pieces that were longer than that. And they said, you look on, and there's like an aluminum beam, eye beam cross section, eye cross section. And it, it looked just plain, it looked, it looked like it was kind of the same material as the foil parts that he also brought back and uh, just had structure to them rather than a very light foil. And if you looked at them dead on, there wasn't anything uh, appreciable, but if you held it at an angle, then these symbols would appear on the, in, between the, in between the shoulders, it's called. And especially if you held the light a certain way, they became very perceptible. They were like a light violet in color. And it, they, my grandfather at that point remarked that you guys are probably the first ones to ever see this alien language in history. So nobody's ever seen this before. And they, uh, it's, that's always been an interesting part of the story. And you couldn't see them on, straight on, so they're almost like, a, it's, it hasn't been said, but from what, I, I, it, almost like a hologram, in that, it, that, that they, they had dimension only once you would angle them at a certain, at a certain degree. Crescent moons, uh, dashes, dots, that sort of thing. Um, and it, it, it took, like I said, it took on this really strange appearance. Uh, there was a lot of rather thick foil-like material, uh, kind of a, not a uh, shiny aluminum, but uh, burnished or a uh, slate gray type of aluminum metal. Uh, there was a black plastic type debris, like bakelite, which was shattered. It was very brittle material. And then there were uh, fragments of what appeared to be eye beams. Relatively small, but uh, the typical high beam type configuration. So 1947 could have been the dawn of a new age. To some extent it was. It was the age when the UFO phenomenon began. But the UFO phenomenon is a question mark. And 1947 could have been an answer. Just after the Second World War, we could have been told that after all the horrors of the Second World War, the millions of people who died, that actually we were not alone in the universe. That this path which we walked on isn't just ours, but one which is walked by various other species. And some of these species come to planet Earth. That there is definitive proof we are not alone. Imagine for a brief moment in time what that world would look like. But instead what we've had is 60 more years of question marks, of cover-ups, of denials and crazy stories told sometimes by the government and sometimes by people who just want to become part of the Roswell story. But so far we still have a question. And what Jesse Marcel and his entire family have always known is that it is not about questions. They know that there are answers. They have seen it they are absolutely convinced because they know. And so when they tell you that they know, we should take it for value. We should take it as this. The truth of Roswell is that something happened in 1947, in the early days of July. Something crashed just north of Roswell and broke into two pieces. Jesse Marcel found one piece and took it home with him showed it to his family. A few days later, when that material was all cleared off, they found a second crash site containing 
victims of the wreck. And at that moment in time, our world changed. Because rather than a public revelation or public awareness of the UFO phenomenon, a government cover-up was put in place. Roswell remains a question mark, but only if you do not want to believe that there is an answer. Under orders from Colonel Blanchard, Jesse Marcel and a man in plain clothes took the crash debris back to the Roswell Air Base. There it was flown to Wright-Patterson and sequestered away to be studied. The broken pieces of the craft were kept in a secure location codenamed the Blue Room, and the legend of Roswell was born. What is the Blue Room? Various question marks exist as to whether or not there is a facility at Wright-Patterson Airfield Base, which really is the container of everything which your government doesn't want you to know. It is said that within the Blue Room, the secrets of UFOs can be found. And some even suggest that the name Blue Room has to do with the fact that in the 1950s there was a government inquiry called Project Blue Book, which allegedly went in search of the truth as to what UFOs were all about but in reality was just another cover-up. It's probably no coincidence that one of the people who was involved with Project Blue Book was Roger Remy, the guy who in 1947, a few years later, told Jesse Marcel to deny the truth as to what happened in Roswell. He was the one who pushed a weather balloon into Jesse Marcel's hands and basically told him to go on the record and say that he had misidentified a weather balloon as a flying saucer. I went from it when it went to Hangar 18. That that was pretty much the end of my grandmother's direct contact with the material. You know, up to that point, he was able to handle it, that sort of thing. Um, on a side story, while all of this was happening, there was, uh, if you recall, the, the debris field was approximately a, a span shape, three quarters of a mile long, littered fairly evenly with material. Most more, the more perceptible would be the foil you can see from the sun shining. But uh, in that, in the debris field, it, 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 soon after, there was a call and there was like a crashed hull of a UFO about 25 miles away. Now, my grandfather was not involved in that whatsoever. He did not see it, he wasn't part of it, but he also stood by the people who saw it. He said, I didn't see it, but the people who talked about this, I believe them. I mean, there, there's no reason not to believe his co-workers and other people in intelligence. It, it's, it, when they went out to investigate it, you know, saying, why didn't my grandfather investigate that site? The bigger this became, the military does like to compartmentalize things. They would not want to have one individual having all of the information. So it goes hand in hand as to why he would not have been part of that second site. The second site was interesting. There's reports of alien bodies, of, 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 of an alien that actually had lived and through the crash injured but was alive uh, and that became a, a, a lot of there was a lot of uh, the story came down to where on the base uh, there's medical work done on cadavers uh, of aliens that sort of thing Major Jesse Marcel never saw the bodies, but it is clear that a few days later bodies were recovered. And so what we have here is a story of two halves. The story of somebody who has handled material which he absolutely knew was not of this earth. And a few days later he probably got confirmation when they found the bodies that indeed this material came not from this planet. In the three weeks following Roswell, Jesse Marcel was given leave. And we don't know what happened, whether he was put somewhere and questioned or whether he became part of the people who was allowed to investigate the Roswell crash any further. But it is clear that once he returned to Roswell, either immediately or in the coming weeks, that he began to speak to other people. And even though he probably didn't get definitive proof as in another eye beam in his hands, he probably knew more than anybody else that what really had happened at Roswell was precisely what we are piecing together. The story of an extraterrestrial craft which crash landed in the desert just north of Roswell, New Mexico. As researchers began to delve into the Roswell story, specific facts started to emerge. 
more eyewitnesses were willing to come forward. The route and locations where the debris had been taken and stored was identified, and a clear picture of the incident slowly formed from the available information. Even the man in plain clothes who traveled with Jesse to the crash site was identified. The man who went with Jesse Marcel to the crash site was Sheridan Kevin. For a number of years he was only known as Kev, and then his name was identified as a man from the counterintelligence corps at Roswell. Only in the 1980s did Sheridan Cavett begin to relate his side of the story, and he wasn't willing to say much. Basically, he says, early on, that he wasn't there, that he wasn't even in Roswell when the alleged Roswell crash happened. He says that Jesse Marcel was never there. And then when some inquiries began to push further, he really began to open up a bit. And in 1994, he was asked to make an official comment, a signed affidavit in which he said that indeed he had been there, but that what he'd seen was a weather balloon. Cavett was a man of counterintelligence, which basically means he was paid to lie. And it seems he took this into the grave. Brigadier General Roger Ramey was the head of the 8th Army Division in Fort Worth. A few days before Roswell, he actually said that there was no such thing as UFOs, that what Kenneth Arnold had seen over Mount Rainier in Washington State were just misidentifications of something else. In 1952, when there was a big UFO flap over Washington, he would once again say that there is no truth whatsoever to UFO phenomena. However, it seems that Remain knew the truth, that there was something to the UFO phenomenon. In the press conference of 1947, he clearly holds something in his hands which refers to victims of the wreck. He is probably principally responsible, or was acting on orders coming from the Pentagon, that the truth about UFOs should be covered up. And it seems he was just the man for the job. And in 1952, when Washington gets one of the biggest waves of UFO sightings ever seen, he is once again the man on the job who says that the American people have nothing to fear about, that all of this is perfectly normal, it's just business as usual, ET doesn't exist. Why was Roswell covered up? Many people have said that it happened because the American government wanted to benefit somehow from the technology it had recovered at the crash site. But I think really what pushed it home was the fact that they had to announce that alien life existed. And I think in 1947, the people, and especially the American government, were simply not ready to do so. Various people have to try to get access to the Blue Room. One of them was Senator Barry Goldwater. He wrote to the likes of Curtis LeMay asking for information and or access to the Blue Room. There are various renditions as to the reply which Curtis LeMay gave him. They differ on the amount of expletives used. But basically Goldwater was told that in no circumstances was he ever going to see the inside of the Blue Room. Goldwater wasn't acting on his own. It is a little known fact that Goldwater was very good friends with Colonel Blanchard and probably for many years the two of them tried to get to the truth as to what had happened after Roswell with the debris which was recovered from the crash site. There's a reason why Goldwater became interested in Roswell. It's a little known fact that Goldwater and Blanchard were very close friends. And so Goldwater was trying to use a political angle to get the American military to reveal to him what the truth about Roswell was and what the secret of the Blue Room was. And so what we have here is a story which spans decades. We have our core group once again. We know 
that Blanchard and Marcel officially never said ET or UFO crashed at Roswell. But we also know that they knew. And behind the scenes they sometimes spoke to certain people who they knew or thought they might help and who they knew had an interest in the story as well. The Roswell story continued to spread behind the scenes and within the confines of top secret circles. However, within the Marcel family itself, questions ran deep as well. Not about the existence of extraterrestrial life, but the meaning of it all. By bringing home materials from the crash site, Jesse Marcel had set into motion a quest for understanding that would endure through three generations, beginning with his son, Jesse Marcel Jr. Oh, uh, because that, at that era, you know, flying saucers were in the rage, you know, you read about these reports in the papers, and these sensational magazines and things like that, which tend to degrade the story. I never discussed this with any of my friends either. I, uh, I had a lot of friends and, uh, and acquaintances in Roswell, and I can definitely say I never even told them about what was going on. Because I felt that maybe this was a probe that happened to land on our planet from someplace else. From another planet. From another origin. I, yeah, we, we felt it was all a very unique experience, that uh, you know, we just had to be at the right place at the right time to see. In those early days, it never was a question, it was just a truth. They had the evidence in their hand and they could stare at it. They saw alien inscriptions, an alien language, and they probably wondered what really had happened in Roswell. Whether it was an accident or whether it was something more. Where these people came from. And so imagine you have this evidence in your hands, but you still have questions. Well, my initial reaction was, Maybe most of these were hoaxes and uh, maybe a misidentification of things, but I do know of one that was not a hoax or misidentification. They were, again, looked like the same type of material that the foil like materials made of. Uh, metallic, uh, uh, dull gray aluminum, looks very light again. Uh, I did not try to bend it or stress it in any way, although the piece I remember looking at was about. Uh, 12 to 18 inches in length. Both ends, I think, were shattered or broken off. It wasn't a clean cut. And uh, the material thickness appeared to be about a sixteenth of an inch. Well, the most unusual part of this whole thing was what was on the I beam, on the inner surface of the I beam. Because uh, as you look at it head on, there appeared to be a type of writing in the, on the mainframe itself. Uh, this writing was uh, definitely a purplish violet hue. Uh, it did have uh, an embossed appearance because you could, if I recall, you could rub your finger on it and you could tell it, it had texture. Uh, I don't recall any seeing any lines or letters of any kind, but it was more like geometric shapes. Or, well, it's hard to describe it. It was a curved, curved geometric shapes. There might have been some triangles and certain looked up. Uh, it was solid. Well, I don't recall seeing any piece that was greater than four to six inches in, in circumference or diameter. Uh, I don't recall whether I, I tried to test it for being able to tear it or bend it or anything like that. Uh, it was very light and uh, again, a, a dull metallic gray color. And uh, there was a lot of that. Despite the fact that Jesse Marcel was forced into a lie, personally, with his family, he was always clear because it was undeniable that what he saw and had in his kitchen that one night in July 1947 was evidence of extraterrestrial visitation. And so he raised a family up with the knowledge that we were not alone. His family are probably unique, or at least almost unique, on this planet. Because they are the ones who were raised in an environment where their parents and their grandparents knew that what happened in 1947 
was the existence of extraterrestrial life. And so the likes of Jesse Marcel III is spectacular because here we have a man in his 40s who is absolutely aware since birth that we are not alone. Everything he's done in his life, his explorations into physics, his look upon life, when he looks up to the sky, he realizes certain things which none of us can really grasp because he has been raised with the absolute knowledge that we are not alone. It didn't change, my, my grandfather didn't change in any respect for the next 20 something years. Um, he didn't really change, see it change his personality at all. One introspection about that is that there's a lot of things about, our, was he scared of the intelligence that he came in contact with? And that was never the case. He was more scared of his own government than he was of this intelligence that he came across. Despite the fear of any ramifications Jesse Marcel Sr. may have endured, he did talk with his family about the incident. This usually consisted of brief conversations over the years sparked by some headline or media event in the news. However, Jesse Jr. often talked with his son about the pieces he handled and the infamous eye beam with alien text embossed on it. Later, the family would commission a replica of the eye beam so future generations could see the detail it contained. While in Roswell, Jesse and Philip discussed the I-Beam's construction. Well, this is the I-Beam that we created. It's basically, it's a similar size, the, the, the width, the thickness, that sort of thing, that my father described. And, and the placement of the symbols along it, the colors of the symbols are matching the violet colors that they talked about. And uh, we're not quite sure, we don't have the order of them, that kind of thing. So this is more representative of what it would have looked like, what it would have felt like as far as the size goes. Um, it would have been, as per description of my grandfather, much lighter than this, much stronger than this. But uh, that's pretty much it. And how many of, uh, how many did your grandfather say that were amongst the wreckage? Well, they, my, my, I, my father had mentioned, he said there's about 30 different symbols to the best of his recollection. My grandfather didn't give a precise number. Um, he talked more about crescents that face each other and that sort of thing. Um, he did scribble down some ideas of what he remembered them along with my father, of course. Uh, so about 30, not a certain order. Um, but the size is correct though. And you know, the, the, the kind of the outline is fairly correct. Uh, and how they, the symbols lie between the shoulders of the I beam. In, in past, we've been in talking, it looks like, again, speculation, but it might have been some kind of map. During this interview, Jesse III makes a startling revelation regarding the I beam, in that Colonel Blanchard visited Jesse Sr. a few weeks after the event and brought the I beam back to the Marcel home. When he returned, he returned every piece to the military base. He did exactly as he was told. Well. Sometime after that, Colonel Blanchard, who happened to be a good friend, Blanchard and his wife, came over and they liked to play cards with my grandparents. And uh, they pr played bridge once a week in the evenings. And after everything was gone, the story had died down, Colonel Blanchard brought over a piece of an I-beam. And as my father talking about it, he remember him standing and remembers them standing in, over the sink in the kitchen and the light coming through the window and taking a look at it. There's a big question whether that I beam, that piece, didn't stay with my grandfather. Knowing the importance of it, I, I'm not quite sure if it's that Blanchard had more of it, and maybe it's somewhere there is more of it on that side too, but that, that there's a good possibility that my grandfather and that retained that piece. And so this is pretty much what Colonel Blanchard brought back to the Marcel household. Exactly. This is this is what he would have brought and and stood over the kitchen sink with my grandfather, looking at the window, looking at the light coming through the kitchen window. And you can imagine why he would specifically want to keep this one, because it shows that first of all, it's not human. Mm -hmm. Nobody would do this. Um, 
it looks otherworldly. There are definitely symbols on there which suggest that they knew what they were up to, but not necessarily we knew what they were up to. And it's really the perfect testimony that whatever happened in Roswell is what everybody knows it is, which is none of this earth. Sort of, yeah, it, it really is fascinating. I mean, obviously, the civil fo silver foil would probably be only so interesting after a while, but to actually see the symbols and also be able to, like, you know, in the real one where you would have to look at them at an angle to be able to see them, where they there was no indication of the symbols being there. In fact, they didn't see them until they just happened to hold it, caught the light just right to even notice they were even there. So, definitely very fascinating. So, when did it happen? How long after Roswell did it happen that the kitchen sink was graced with this ivy? You know, I, I can't be exact other than I know it was more than a month after the original crash. As far after that, I, I couldn't tell you, but it was definitely after the return from their three weeks of wherever they went to. So basically, this little incident in the kitchen mm -hmm. is very interesting because there you are, you have two men who have been involved into something, mm -hmm. have then become involved into the cover-up of this something, who realize that for the rest of their lives they really can't talk about this mm -hmm. anymore, but they have this little cozy get-together yep. in a kitchen somewhere, kind of saying, hey look, <laughs> this is real, this happened. This is real, and you know, to an extent, this being kept by Blanchard and being passed down into the family tradition, or whatever happens to this, you know, the fact that something escapes. They always say that, like, no matter how much there has been a massacre, there's always one person who survives and mm. gets out, and this is like the thing which got away from the grasp of the government. That's and, exactly right. Which could still be out there somewhere. Um, but which definitely survived like the initial slaying back in 1947 and again for those two men after having realized that they could have been part of the largest story ever mm -hmm. they became probably part of the largest conspiracy ever um, for them to kind of like sit down and kind of like, probably they, they said something along the lines of we didn't imagine this. <laughs> it was real <laughs> you think that conversation would have almost had to have taken place it's like uh -huh. this yeah, we didn't. Yeah, it's like we didn't imagine this. This is something that happened, and this is part of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, pretty incredible. Mm communicate with people he'd never seen, never talked to from all over the world. Um, and that again was a good part of his life. But he, he didn't he didn't change much during those years. I actually think he changed more in the early 70s than he did in the previous 20, 25 years after the event. Um, the man that I remember in my youngest my, my youngest memories was uh, someone who had a great deal of weight on his shoulders. He, uh, I, you know, on, on, a, on a personal level, I remember actually him, him in tears on his couch, um, head in hands, talking about all the people he had killed in the Second World War. Um, all the, him dropping the bomb, where it, where it was dropped, that it was his fault, that there had to have been a better idea, a better way to do it. There had, you know, he, he, he really suffered deeply from that. Um, and he had had all this pressure from way down, and then you when you add Roswell on top of that, so here is he was questioning his very you know down his very moral fiber, moral fiber about were his actions um, moral? Were were his actions something he was going to pay for with his very soul? After everything he'd done for our military, he decided that he, he was he wanted to separate himself, and he actually destroyed his medals that he had did won during the war, or was received during the war, and. Uh, I, I don't remember him talking much about his military career after that. He just had had, had enough. 
And like I said, that's where he was, he, he had taken the whole weight of the Second World War in Roswell and put him on himself. He, had, he was never one to say, well, he was part of a team, he was a cog, he always put himself in that position to take all the heat, all the weight of what had happened. Over the years, various metals have surfaced and were proclaimed to be debris from Roswell. None of it has ever been verified. So is it possible that Colonel Blanchard sequestered away some of the artifacts from the Roswell crash? If Colonel Blanchard retained one of the I-beams, where is it today? Did he leave an I-beam with Jesse Marcel, perhaps as a token memorial? Or could Blanchard have kept a piece for himself? I believe that there is still a piece of it out there. That uh, there, there, there was, as the story goes, it, it's late at night, my grandpa scoops up all the, all the material, puts in the box and leaves. My grandmother opens up the back door, sweeps out the little pieces that are left, and they get go on the ground, and eventually a concrete pad is poured, and they might still be there today, or might not be, and that sort of thing. That piece that Blanchard has, I had looked at with my grandfather. Would have Blanchard had more than one piece? Did he keep some of it behind himself? Did he, did he, was that one way of him giving a piece back to my grandfather? Because he was very well aware. I mean, he was one of the set down the orders that it all comes back and it's, you know. I would speculate that he still had that piece and that, okay, what would my grandfather have done with it? Uh, the the rot where my, some, somewhere along the bayou in Louisiana. Who else could he trust to bring over a piece of the debris that he shouldn't have had? Because obviously the same with Blanchard shouldn't have been able to keep a piece of it, but yet he did. And by him willing, being willing to go over to my grandfather, and still had, obviously there's a trust there that, um, to look at it and go through it, there was a very strong bond, and I, I would have no doubt that they didn't even become closer after that. So the story of Roswell is really basic. It's the story of a family, a few families, and what they knew. And the question, can we accept it? The American government has since put so many more layers to this story, simply because they know that at heart it is a very basic story. And they want people to doubt it. They want people to question. And if they succeed in putting question marks next to this story, then they have won. And the idea that the Bloom Room was created to contain and guard this information, a, a place that was of, obviously of, uh, to be admitted to the Blue Room to be able to see the debris was a, you, you had to be of a certain level of government there. With the Blue Room created to hide the debris, this the alien debris, the alien technology, um, was perhaps the most guarded secret in all of the world, it matching if not exceeding that of the nuclear bomb program. Uh, it's it's always interesting to, to think back, well, why the Blue Room? And this is just through a little bit of research that the Blue Room is, is, is and in Hangar 18, the number 18 is the atomic symbol for argon, which burns blue. Argon is also used to eliminate oxygen. If you want to, if you want to uh, protect something from oxygen, you would bathe in argon. And it's interesting how all it, it, like it later came out, Project Blue Book, all these things. It's, it's interesting how, this, in a way, how this all pieces together. Maybe it's all coincidence, maybe not. But it, it, it was, it was the Blue Room was the site that was born out of Roswell, of this crash site.
No one knows if the Roswell debris is still hidden in the Blue Room at Wright-Patterson, or if it's been moved to Area 51 or any number of secret vaults the government controls. Nor do we know if it's still being studied, though that would seem logical. We do know the legacy of Roswell will be with us for some time to come. And in time, more revelations about that faithful day may still be gleaned from sources close to the story, such as the Marcel and Blanchard family. We have some documents that were his private, personal, and there's an aberration in them in his writing style right at the time this happened. And uh, we're going to seek out some uh, ourselves. We don't be too. Uh, we we want to have professionals look at it and tell us you know, am I just crazy in this thought, or is there actually something here? And my premise is that he left a trail of breadcrumbs. That there is there's a lot of story left. Imagine a world in which our parents told us that in 1947 beings from another world crash landed. That ever since we live with the knowledge that we are not alone. That is a vastly different world and in my opinion a vastly more beautiful world than the ones we live in right now where we are trying to peel back layers of an onion trying to get to the truth. The truth for the Marcel family is that it happened. The Marcel family is primary evidence, primary eyewitness people who held this material in their hands. One of their endearing moments is Major Chessie Marcel and Blanchard one evening in the kitchen over the kitchen sink holding an eye beam in their hands and saying, do you remember this? This is what is real. And despite millions of people who will never know, and a government who is trying to deny that this ever happened. What I'm holding in my hand and what I'm showing to you is definitive proof of what happened. We do not know what happened to the IB. Maybe Jesse Marcel buried it somewhere or maybe it is in the possession of Blanchard. I'm pretty sure he never gave it back to the government unless he was really instructed to give it back. And as far as we can tell, the government never knew about it until old people involved had died and decades had passed. So the chances of evidence of Roswell having happened out there with people or in an environment where we can get to it is good. The Marcel family has continued to search for their grandfather's diary and records. Recently, after shooting the interviews for this documentary, Jesse III located Marcel Sr.'s lost journals from his time at the 509th Air Base. The journal reveals that Marcel Sr. knew much more about the incident, and there is evidence that Jesse Marcel Sr. did in fact hide some of the wreckage from the crash and it's been hidden away for decades. There's still information to be gained in old photographs and government documents, that sort of thing. But just one thing about being a descendant of his, we do have some of those private documents. He, he actually wrote part of a book to start out with. He uh, kept a diary of his life. It was, it was more of a journalist entry of different, uh, it reads like a history book. Uh, entries, uh, Truman, uh, uh, what, what, whatever he was interested at the time, he wrote down a little thought about. And, you know, 
there might be some information there. there might be, he might have buried something in there, and uh, we're going to see where that goes. I became interested in Roswell in the early 1990s, as so many others. And for many years, decades now, I had various question marks. Certain things about Roswell just didn't make sense. It is clear that the American government is lying, but about what? For the answer, we need to go back to the Marcel family, because they, since 1947, are the primary people involved and the primary holders of this holy grail of ufology. They are the ones who know that what happened in 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico, is real, that an ET being was recovered, that something out of this world crash landed there. They know because they handled the material themselves. For 30 years, they kept quiet. In the last 30 years, they have done their best to tell the world that they are unique witnesses to one of the most unique events ever in human history. The existence of extraterrestrial beings. Fact that we are not alone in the universe. The key message of Roswell is that we are not alone. And this is a message which lives in our hearts and which is cherished by so many. But for so many more it requires validation. And that validation will never come from the scientific community. Because by the very nature of the beast, Roswell can only be validated by officialdom, by the US government. And so to put that final stamp of approval that something happened in 1947 will truly change mankind forever. And at that moment in time, we will no longer become global citizens, but universal citizens. I personally cannot wait for that moment to happen. In the end, I have no doubt that we or somebody else will find a piece of it somewhere. That it's, it, it just, in the information age we're in, there's, Somebody will come forward, a piece of evidence will be found. If it's there, one of, the, one of two things will happen. A civilian will find it, or the government will find it. Either way, and I, I, I can't imagine that there isn't a piece of it still out there somewhere. Can you believe in that? True.